Good morning, everyone. I'm Faith Pinu. Um, so we have a great panel here of folks who are going to be talking about purpose in the workplace, personally, and at the company level, and in the community. And so to start off, um, let's just go down the line, have each of you introduce yourself, your name, title, and organization. And Nicole, we'll start with you. Great. Good morning. My name is Nicole Husband. I'm a vice president of people and culture at Warner Bros. Discovery, and I lead the team supporting Channing Dungy and the Warner Brothers Television Group. Hello, good morning. My name is Gerald Coakley. I'm the Senior Vice President of Human Resources for State of Brothers Markets, uh, which is a regional supermarket chain. We boast 170 stores across Southern California. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Baker. I'm the People Officer and VP for Activision Blizzard. We are the Corporate Function Division of Activision uh, Blizzard King that does Call of Duty, Candy Crush, World of Warcraft, and games like that. Good morning, my name is Octavius Black, not a name I chose or what I'm getting used to. And I run a, I'm a CEO and co-founder of a company called Mind Gym, which we started in my um, kitchen 23 years ago, because in London we can't afford garages. But we're, <laughs> we're very excited. We're now the, the largest pub, uh, publicly quoted behavioral science company in the world. We help organizations, most of the S&P 100, uh, a couple of lovely people on this panel, and, and others deal with areas through the culture, leadership, and performance. And most exciting of all today, we're launching a new research paper on well-being. So that is available for anyone who wants to find out more at our stand down below. Great. Matt Stone, I'm Senior Solutions Consultant with Attuned, uh, helping uh, managers make work more meaningful for them, their teams uh, through intrinsic motivation. And um, my other job uh, through my own company is I'm a leadership management consultant. I do a lot of work untangling complex conflicts and other issues at the Pentagon and in higher ed. Uh, and in fintech and other companies. So it's really good to be here with you and I'm excited for our discussion, thanks. Lots of different and diverse perspectives here, which is gonna make for a great conversation. Um, so I just wanna start very simple before we get into purpose and why this is so important. Just please answer the very simple question, why is purpose-motivated work important? And Octavius, I know you have a really interesting study that speaks to this, so you start. Yes, I mean, we're scientists, so we're constantly interested in research. There's a brilliant psychologist called Amy Rosensky who uh, ran this research asking hospital janitors, janitors and doctors to rate their work on the degree to which they thought it was a job to make money, a career to progress, or a calling in order to make an impact in the world. Uh, and what she found was that people who saw it as a calling, unsurprisingly, enjoyed their work more, actually worked harder, and were more satisfied with life. But what was more interesting, potentially, is that the difference between the doctors and the hosp hospital janitors was not a, nothing at all. Each of them said it was a third job, a third career, and a third calling. So that gives us real hope that all of us, no matter what we're doing, can find a calling in what we do. And when we do it, we'll be better off as a result. I want to take the next question, because um, sometimes purpose is not always easy to find or follow amid company changes. So um, I'll start first with Nicole and then Amy. How do you keep a company's mission and a company's sense of purpose clear and consistent amid internal company change and reorganizations and things like this? Well, you may know I have a little experience with this being at Warner Bros. Discovery, which has been uh, I guess I've been there about 20 years and there have been three name changes since I've been there and two acquisitions and multiple changes in leaders. So uh, I love that you said clear and consistent. I'm gonna use a bunch of C's, uh, the good C's in this, uh, with my answer to this. I just think clear, constant, consistent communication uh, about what the company's mission is. And so the way that we've done that at Warner Bros. Discovery is we have these guiding principles that they issued as Warner Bros. Discovery to say, these are this is what guides us. This is our mission, right? Uh, and so I'm gonna try and impress you and say the five guiding principles here. Let me see if I can remember them. So act as one team, uh, create what's next, empower storytelling, which is important at a, a content company like we are, right? Uh, champion inclusion, and then dream it, own it. Applause, welcome here, <laughs> thank you. I can't say that every every employee is able to do that, but we do have it posted for those who haven't memorized it like I have. And there's a drill down on each of those, right? So 
putting those in front of people to the point where they can't stand it anymore. They're like these doggone guiding principles, right? And bringing it up constantly and folding it into our priorities and folding it into even to the level of individual goals, which we were asked to say, what are the goals that we have as an individual? Put those in work day. Anybody done that, right? And then tie that to what our priorities are. So I think it's that. And then also we have done a lot of work around acknowledging the difficulty in leading through change. So acknowledging it is a big deal, but then also providing education about how we lead through change. And part of that is drawing employees back to why are we actually here? It's a little easier in Warner Brothers Television where people love creating TV, right? Uh, but it's still something that we have to do on a regular basis. So that's my, my short answer to the question. <laughs> Great answer. Amy? Um, I would say I've gone through this or am going through this now, and I've gone through this in a different way at Netflix. So prior to being at ABK, I was at Netflix for six and a half years. And I would say the change there was the rapid growth that we went through. So you had what they called the old regime and the new regime, the people who had been there when the culture was born, the people who lived and breathed it. Then you had all these people coming in, especially from the entertainment industry, who didn't work in the way that the Netflix culture wanted them to work, whether that's feedback, whether that's not being hierarchical, whether it's, um, you know, just freedom and responsibility, good judgment, being curious, all those kinds of things. And so you would have these people saying, I feel like we're growing so fast. And I was, I was saying a stat the other day, I, when I left Netflix, I had been there longer than 93% of the company. So mm -hmm. that was the growth we went through in that short, short period of time. Our studio went from 10 people to 800. And all of these people came from entertainment, mostly on set because we needed productions and things like that. Um, and so people would say, oh, I feel like the culture's changing. People aren't giving feedback directly right now. This is different. And we used to, I used to always use this analogy about like ice cubes being thrown into boiling water. I was like, we're gonna dilute for a minute. We're gonna get warm for a minute, but then it's my work, it's your work as a leader to be helping these people acclimate to the change that they're going through by coming into this company. And so that was a huge focus. Like we had the culture memo to guide people. You could point to an exact area in that memo where it said, this is, a guide of how we would handle this situation. You're dealing with this with your leader, this is a guide of how we would do it. So having things so crystal clear like that, that somebody can point back to, incredibly helpful. Um, and they're just so culture driven. I'm going through it now at Activision Blizzard because we just got acquired by Microsoft, that little company, if you don't know it, it's <laughs> tech, it's a couple people. Um, and so that just closed about three weeks ago. And when I started with them last January, I think it was about January 18th, they announced the acquisition, 2022. Um, and so we've spent the last 20 years in this ambiguous, what, is it gonna happen? We don't know if it's gonna happen. Should we even do our performance management? Should we not? I don't know, like we might be another company tomorrow. Uh, and so we've been working through that. And to what Nicole was saying, being super clear about what's happening next, what people can expect has been incredibly helpful. My team is corporate functions. You know, we're all the finance, the legal, the HR, the comms, like this is our group. And so there's more angst coming out of there than probably the game developers, people close to the IP. And so as I'm getting context, I trust my team explicitly. So I'm gonna tell them the things, I trust them to keep it confidential, but it's gonna help them get in the right mindset of like what they can expect the next week. Every day is going to be different right now. And so that's, that's where I'm anchoring to, is just providing that context and being, I guess I'm diving in more on like the one-on-ones, how are you feeling, check-ins, because people are all over the place, super excited, super nervous. And so you gotta operate in that spectrum. I call it like the HR skeleton key. You gotta be able to open any door with people. Uh, and so that's been hugely helpful. That sounds like you added the sea of communication to Nicole's list, right? <laughs> Just making sure everyone's really on the same page. Yeah. Um, this next one, I'll start with Gerald and then Matt and Octavius. Um, you know, oftentimes employees come to work with their own sense of a calling or personal sense of purpose, and maybe that doesn't exactly align with what the company's mission or purpose is. So I'm curious, like, what do you think um, a company can do to meet employees where they're at and kind of engage with that purpose? And also, what is a manager's role in, um, in engaging that individual employee. This is where the paradigm actually needs to be flipped. Organizations tend to be very self-absorbed and flatly selfish. So it's all about our purpose, not about your purpose. But the more you engage in the conversation about what's important to you, you will find that alignment. 
And so the more that you know the organization is going to pour into you, then now that relationship is built. So the problem is organizations don't spend enough time investing in its employees to build the relationship. So if you speak to someone and you talk enough with someone, you will find that joint alignment. You'll find a joint cause and you'll be able to motivate and inspire the employee. But likewise, the employees will begin to uh, inspire you as well. So you have to start with that conversation conversation first and find out what you can accomplish together and share that story. And now it becomes a joint story that you can collectively tell and accomplish great things together. But you have to show your employees that you find them valuable. And it's about our cause and how it, it fits together. That's a great answer. Matt, do you want to jump in? I'm going to say what Gerald said in different words. I hope that's okay, because uh, that was spot on. I just, the word that really resonates with me and the work that I do is relationship, relationship, relationship. And the fact that while I'm also a former practicing lawyer, while a corporation is technically, legally a person, a corporation is made up of a whole bunch of people. And those people are the ones who make the culture. So you can have all the memos in the world, but it's the people, we're tribes, you know, we carry the tradition, the oral tradition, the manager telling you, this is how we do things here. And yet that person who just came on board could cr be creating a ripple effect that changes the culture ever so slightly. And it could be in a positive way if we're in the kind of relationship where there's a healthy, open dialogue going back and forth so that we're all learning together, no matter where we are in the hierarchy. Um, and I'll just, I think to a story back when I was 15, I got my very first job at a supermarket <laughs> in Oregon called Roth's, run by a guy named Orville Roth. And he had a green bow tie and an <laughs> apron. And the whole signature of that supermarket was is that you would bag people's groceries and you'd walk them out to their car with them and you'd make small talk. I mean, it was great for a 15 year old to, I'm very shy, so you know. So it really brought me out. Um, but uh, I remember Orville would come in, he had a number of stores, and I was, I was counting bottles, like I was the best bottle counter that we would do because I hated it. And they loved it. So I guess who counted all the bottles, right? So this got me some attention. And I was friendly with people, but Orville used to come around and he would introduce me to other customers as, Matt's gonna be governor someday. Now here I am bagging groceries, I'm 15, <laughs> But what I was getting out of that job was, see, he saw me for what I could be. And it wasn't at the supermarket. Mm -hmm. And that always stuck with me. And um, I think a workplace is such an important place. It may not be where you're gonna retire, but you can have a really meaningful couple of years there that helps everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that's all of our jobs as human beings, wherever we are. So vote for Matt for governor is what I'm hearing. <laughs> I don't want to be in politics right now. Maybe you could write an Fair article enough. about that. <laughs> you want to stay out of it, trust yeah. me. Octavius, did you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I just I think really all of this is local. The, the most important thing is, is as an individual that I feel that what I do matters and we want to create something that's significant and that's important. And so I totally uh, support the corporate missions because that helps us give us belonging and connection. I think it would be strange to sign up to work somewhere where you disagreed with their mission or purpose. Why wouldn't you go choose somewhere you did agree? I mean, that would be mm. an obvious thing to do. But the, really thing, the thing that really matters is, is the st work I've done today worthwhile? Uh, an experiment that a professor we worked with did was he got people to do a, a kind of word search exercise and they got $2 for the first one and 180 for the next and 160 for the one after. Uh, and the, the first group, they wrote their name on the word search, they handed it in each time. The second group didn't write their name on it, they just handed it in. And the third group, it got shredded in front of them. So the interesting question was who kept going for longest and for how much longer? And what was interesting, the first group, the ones who wrote their name on it, they did on average 9.03 word searches. The second group, they didn't put their name on it, they still handed it in. They did 6.77. That's a 25% decrease. Mm. The ones that actually got shredded was only 6.3. It wasn't a massive difference from that. So not feeling noticed, not feeling recognized is incredibly important. Uh, there's another big study on people's doing the workplace diaries on what constitutes a good or a bad day at work. And on 75% of people's good days, they feel they made progress and on only 25% of their worst days. So this sense of personal purpose is absolutely pivotal. I think someone talked about the manager being a really important role in this, and that relationship, that dialogue, is how do I make you feel important? How do I make you feel that what you do matter? How do I make you feel that what you're contributing to is something that you couldn't do by yourself, but others couldn't have done without you? Mm -hmm. 
I got kind of a follow up question to this because um, you mentioned, you know, if, if a person is coming to work at a place, hopefully they know the mission and they somewhat align with it. And maybe they do. Maybe they just have a mismatch of a job qualification or something. They're in the wrong position. So I'm just going to open this up. I mean, whose responsibility should that be then? If, if people are noticing there's a mismatch there, things aren't quite gelling. Is it on the employee, the manager, someone in HR? Like whose responsibility is to make that fix? I'll jump in first. It's always the accountability of the leader to notice it first. But it shouldn't be noticed from a negative standpoint. Something is off. Then take it upon yourself to take accountability. What can I do? Let me engage with you. Uh, So most people, we're in a grocery business. So it's not like little kids grow up all over the place and say, when I grow up, I want to run a grocery store. It's not how it works. And so they come there and they get a job and normally it fits into what they need at the point in time. I need a job. I need to make some money. I'll probably will move on. But then if it's a really great place and I'm aligned with the mission and I enjoy it and I really like the people I work with, then I'll decide to stay. So about that seven year mark, is when we can win our teammates over to really want to stay. And so if that misalignment is there, maybe we need to change the conversation. Normally the misalignment is we're so concentrated on performance and that is not what people really care about. So we have all these systems in place and all these consultants make so much money off of us because they tell us it's all about performance. No, it's really about development. People want to know that their leader is helping them get to their personal greatness. And so if you're concentrating on helping someone else become great, they're going to attach themselves to you because you can't find very many people like that in your life. So then if they know you're going to develop them, then they're going to give you the performance that you want. Over 90 percent of all employees at least meet expectations anyway. So why do we have so many systems built for the negative rather than more systems built for the positive? So as a leader, if you concentrate on development more than performance, you get the gift of their performance back. Hmm. I think I just want to weigh in. I love that. I just want to weigh in on something we're saying when we're talking about development, it feels like we're um, just kind of getting over the fact that a lot of that is listening, right? So when I think about your question, I think about, yes, the supervisor is involved. Yes, the, the onus is on the employee to look for opportunities too. And the onus is on talent acquisition and your HR person to help you with that, right? But a lot of the conversations around that should not be telling. And that's been my experience, right? Working for a lot of different supervisors and what I'm trying not to do as a leader, but more listening. What is it that you want to do? What is it that you're not getting out of this? What is it that I can do differently to be that leader that you need me to be to help you to succeed and grow? So I think there's a part of development that we don't talk about, which is how about you listen? Mm -hmm. (laughs) How about you find out? And it's the same thing with companies and corporations. How about you listen to what the employees are saying instead of you just automatically know what it is? How about those priorities, those guiding principles are set up after you do some listening and understanding where people are and then decide where we go from there, as opposed to just telling, because there's so much of the corporate environment is just about telling, right? Yeah, I feel like it goes back to what Gerald was saying earlier about, you know, recognizing the value of the employee first and then making a change from there. Also, Gerald, I do want to just counter what you said. When I was a little kid, I my family laughed at me. I said I wanted to grow up and be a cash register because <laughs> I didn't know the difference between a cashier and a cash register. Um, uh, we should have openings. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'll was brush it. that was PayPal. Yeah, they did yeah. <laughs> Missed the mark on that. Um, okay, so we've been talking about how great purpose is. Yay, purpose. Let's um, flip this idea a little bit on its head because. Um, sometimes in conversations around purpose in the workplace, um, it, you know, it comes about that there can be too much purpose. People get too invested, too passionate. They spend too much time with their jobs and that can lead to burnout. Um, and this is obviously especially true for places like nonprofits and social purpose corporations, places like that. So, um, I'll start with Nicole and then we can go to Octavius, Amy, whoever else wants to jump in. Um, how can you ensure a healthy work-life balance while you're still driving that mission forward? What kind of guardrails should you consider? And when can pushing a purpose be too much? First, I just it's hitting me this whole idea of a healthy work-life balance. I just 
think it doesn't exist ever. You, you are seeking, 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 constantly trying to get there. And so I think the best that we can do, and I don't mean to bring everybody down, but what, what <laughs> the best that we can do or what we should do First, when uh, a couple of years ago, when we were back when we were more in the media, there was a lot of discussion about burnout. What is burnout, right? Acknowledging it. What can we do to combat burnout? I felt like that was really helpful to at least you're listening. I'm telling you I'm burned out in some sort of way. I'm showing up that way or I'm saying that. So you're listening and you're going to do something to acknowledge that, right? So we had a lot of resources around what is burnout? How do you combat that? I think the, the one thing I think of about burnout, though, is like, a lot of times employers are saying it's on you, right? So you go take a yoga class or take a day off or take your vacation or whatever, but I'm never truly away from this. So what is the company doing to combat burnout other than giving me a webinar to take where, okay, you've got to try and get a healthy work-life balance, right? I need more than that, right? So are you looking at the resourcing? Do I have enough people on my staff? Uh, are we set up in a way that makes it so that burnout is a likelihood or it's a possibility that we can deal with because we are properly staffed? So I think the onus is not just on me as an employee to deal with my burnout, but on the leader and on the company to try and find ways to deal with burnout. And then a couple of other, other things, and I, I go to all the mental, anybody here go to all the mental health, well-being thing? <laughs> yes, I see people nodding, right? The, anything they offer that's about mental health and well-being, I do. Luckily, our company is doing a lot of that because we've been through so much change and integration and I talked about the leading through change and also how do we deal with the fact that we do have, our resources are compromised in any integration, right? I'm sure Amy can speak to this, right? There is some reorganize, reorganizing that leads to cutting down of the staff, right? So how do we support our employees through that? The uncertainty about change, right? all of the fears and anxiety about change. And so uh, we have all of these on-demand resources that we can access through uh, Grokker. And we also are out there working as a PNC team, working to support our teams. The thing I'd say is I think we need a little bit more support on the PNC side or on the HR side. Like how about supporting the people in HR who are supporting so many leaders with all of their burnout? Like anybody have a solution for that? Please, you're right, please let me know, right, so. <laughs> Uh, I think we, we just done some very interesting research on what actually changes employees' well-being. Uh, and there's a big study um, that was over 18 months. There were 32 different well-being initiatives from all the mental health uh, applications, from yoga, from meditation, from doctor's advice, and so on and so forth. About 3,000 people went through this um, well-being initiative, but about 22,000 did not. So there was a really decent sample size. And what they found was on 78 out of 80 measures, there was no change between the people who'd been through the programs versus those who had not. Wow. Which is, there only the BMI was the body mass index was the same, sleep was the same, mental health was the same. The two things that were intent to change weight and a little more physical exercise. But the other 78 hadn't moved at all, productivity and so forth. So we thought this was really fascinating because we, we follow the facts. And we then looked at what is it that actually determines our well-being. And broadly, if you imagine three overlapping circles. There's the stuff that we're born with or that we have in early childhood or genes that, that we've inherited. Then there's the bit that ourselves, our history. Then there's a the bit that happens outside of work. You know, what, do we have a loving partner? Do we have a dog that we get on with? Does our soccer team we're going to lose at the weekend? All this stuff that is outside of work. And then we have the stuff at work. Is my boss an idiot or are they supportive? Yeah? <laughs> That's Amy smiling there. I don't know why she's smiling about that. But, uh, um, and, and what happens is that most of us organizations are trying to change the life outside of work bit. So we get people to do more exercise, we eat more healthfully, all of which is good stuff. But the point is people don't listen to their employer on this or they don't change massively as a result. So Nicole does all the self meditation and mental health because you're interested in that and you might well do it in any case. Mm -hmm. And the people who take up the corporate gym membership don't suddenly go, oh, I'm gonna pump on because it's free membership. <laughs> They're all the people who would have done it in the first place. So what we looked at is what can companies do that will have the most and most consistent impact. And this is really interesting. We basically uh, separated ill-being and well-being. Often we think of it like it's one axis, but just because I haven't got a broken leg does not mean I can run a marathon. And I'm, I'm living proof of that. Um, <laughs> so we did two axes, well-being and ill-being. And ill-being, you clearly want to be low, and well-being, you clearly want to be high. 
So there's a, a terrible place in the bottom corner, high ill-being, low well-being. Those are people who are, who are in, in crisis. They're about 4%. We did a big study of US and UK white-collar population. We definitely need to do blue-collar. We definitely need to go to other countries, but this is the starting point. Then you have those that are a bit better on the well-being, but still um, quite high on ill-being. They're struggling, about 14%. Then the next group up are the group called the fragile thrivers. Now, if you own that thing, if you've got something that's important, give it to a busy person, well, that busy person is probably a fragile thriver. They look like they're really coping, they're doing incredibly well, they're your high potentials, but they're at risk of falling into struggling or, or um, uh, uh, a crisis. And we've got the other group, the other axis in that, that they're low on ill beings, so they're not in the suffering, not close to burnout, but they're also low on well being. And they're called boring out. It might be the quiet quitters. Now, for the fragile thrivers, you definitely want to reduce their workload or give them more capacity. If you do that for the people who are boring out, it would only make them even more bored. It would be an absolute disaster. So what we looked at was what are the drivers that matter most? And purpose is one of them. The others are belonging, competence, uh, uh, confidence, and autonomy. And what we found is you need to increase the purpose for the boring out people. They're the people who are disengaged, disenfranchised, can't know quite why I'm here. But you've got massive purpose for the fragile thrivers, and that's where you need to move in separately mm. and say, how can we give you more, comp more certainty and how can we give you more competence? So that, that's how you can model this. And the key with wellbeing is that one size fits no one. So how do you customize and purpose this in order to help mm. people where, where they're at? That's really interesting. I just add to that that we're coming out of this super weird time, and at some point we'll stop saying that. But people have just spent <laughs> maybe maybe we might be weird forever. I don't know. Yeah. But we've just spent three years waking up, and for a lot of people, moving to the desk next to their bed and opening their laptops. And so when you live in that kind of world, and then you close it, but it's still there, and you check an email at night, we're blended now in the way that we work. It's it's not the days anymore of going into an office at eight or nine o'clock leaving at five and not thinking about it again until eight or nine o'clock the next day. We're connected by our phones, our iPads, our watches are going off. I hear my emails dinging in. So it's on all of us in a way, but I think about it as like a leader modeling for their employees. If I'm on vacation, I'm really trying not to check in on things. I'm really trying not to email. I'm really trying for my team not to see me mm -hmm. working while I'm out. You know, and helping them manage through that as well, because it can be cutthroat too. People feel like if I'm not the person who's responding to an email at three o'clock in the morning because that's when this team is on and they're doing it, mm. then I'm not going to be looked at for a promotion. I'm going to get overlooked for merit. I'm going to get overlooked for different things. And so trying to model and then also help my team plan for it. If, some, if I know somebody has two weeks coming off and they're taking this amazing trip to Croatia or something, I'm going to be like, what does it look like for you to be out of the office? What's important that's happening during that time that we can like think about now? Who, who is going to be on your out of office that people are going to go to? Who, what leaders do you need to tell that you're going to be out? It's a little bit of work ahead of time to be able to truly check out when you, when you get out of the office. And so doing things like that or like setting those timers on emails so that they don't send until Monday morning at seven o'clock. You know, we, they have these tools now to help us. Um, but we're all just coming out of this space of like a blended for sure, a blended way of working. I was thinking about it, what everyone was saying, and, and thinking about a project I did earlier this year at, at a company, and um, we were trying to get deep into their engagement scores. And so I you know, participated in interviewing a whole bunch of people. And um, one of the top takeaways from that, those focus groups, was um, we, yes, we have all these programs on paper and whatever, but the managers don't tell us about them, mm. or they model behavior that's counter to what they're saying, so the audio doesn't match the video. And that's culture. It's like, oh yeah, we have, you, you could take time off. Sure. <laughs> I took time off six years ago when <laughs> I had my leg, you know, operated on. I had a kid. <laughs> but I, I was working from the hospital bed. But you, by all means, self-care. <laughs> um, I have to go do an interview now. So it's like, um, you know, there's a lot of that. But I, I, it's easy to pick on managers. But I really think the CEOs need to step in here because the new manager class these days, and I heard this from old timer managers who said, we used to have managers whose job was 80% actually managing people. Mm. And now they're doing their job. Oh, and they're a manager. And I don't know how you expect someone to do a full-time job and care and feed human beings. It's just so impossible to do that, yeah. to have the kind of relationship that it takes. 
And I'll say the last thing, I saw some interesting data that Attune put out on motivation. One of the top motivator trends in the last year that's changed is motivation around social relationships. And I think that desire to have connection with people. You know, if you're in a relationship, you're less likely to die from a disease because you have a, someone will pay attention to you and say, hey, my sister caught cancer on my, on my throat. Huh. And I, because of my sister, I went and checked it out hmm. just because I was there with her. Well, at the workplace, who's your friend who's going to be like, hey, I think you're suffering. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we really need that kind of humanity baked into the way, the structure of the organization and the culture. And that takes a CEO and executives who model that behavior so that their managers don't just say the words and then they're modeling what's coming from the top usually. So it's, it's on all of us, I think, is my point. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I think burnout can definitely, it's a cultural trickle, right? It comes by leading by example. Um, along these same lines of kind of coming in maybe without a purpose, um, <laughs> I was thinking about, and, and this I'm opening up to everyone, so start, start thinking. Um, my, I have a family member who shall remain anonymous, who, um, <laughs> who like just very openly does not, want to have a purpose with her work. She makes really good money. She's like pretty high up in the medical field. Um, and her thing is like goes in, collects a paycheck, clocks out, does not think about work outside of work. She's turned down promotions. She's turned down leadership opportunities. She's great. Like people love her, but she's just like, no, I'm not here. I don't, I don't want to engage with the, with the purpose here. So the question in this is what do you do with employees like this family member who don't want to have purpose at work, um, who just kind of want to clock in and clock out? How would you engage with them, and do you have to engage with them? I feel like thinking, only easy let it, let, only let it easy be. Questions. Let it be. Like there's yes. new Beatles uh, <laughs> song, <laughs> song that's going to be coming out, and a whole documentary on it. But like, it, in order to make a team, like you're thinking about a baseball team, right? Like everyone is not the person that hits a home run. You can't have all star hitters, all star pitchers, all star whatever it is. You need all these different types. So what's wrong with a person who is like? You don't have to worry about me. I'm going to come in. I'm going to do the job. I mean, I want somebody on my team like that that's not like, when's my next promotion? Am I, I just started <laughs> two weeks ago. I'm ready. When do I get your job, right? I, we don't want everybody to be like that. So we do need, we just went through this whole, like using the nine box and talent evaluations. And some of our leaders were so reticent to, to put someone in core talent. What's wrong with being core talent? What's wrong with having a lot of core talent? There's nothing wrong with that. I don't want all superstars who are every day so ambitious and trying to do that. I actually want a team made up of lots, of, nobody on that bottom row, right? For those of you that know the nine box, but somewhere in the top six boxes sounds good to me. So everybody doesn't have to be the top talent wins my next promotion. There's nothing, I just see nothing wrong with that. And I too have a, she's more of a friend sister than a family member, but she's not in any organizations. She works her job. She takes her vacations. She loves her life. What am I doing wrong? I'm always yeah. on a panel at some group, at some meeting or whatever. Like her life sounds pretty good to me. And they want to make her a partner at her law firm. I'm a former lawyer too. And she's like, no, thank you. Yeah. Just keep my paychecks coming. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that? Wrong so with I'm going to say I'm, I'm with your friend. I'm, I think it's all right. <laughs> Do we have any counter? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I'm, not, I'm not a counter. I'm not no, a counter. No, no, counter. Amy, Amy and then Octavius. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think it depends also if you're an independent contributor versus a leader, mm. because a leader does have to somewhat be the cheerleader for that team. And so if they're not drinking the Kool-Aid of the company, and I don't mean that in like an extreme way, but if, the, <laughs> if, they're, if they're not like pumped about the mission, if they're not there to like really get on board with it, then it can impact the team because they're a model or, you know, a role model. I had friends in the same, doing the same thing who work at certain studios around LA and I know they're amazing people. I know they're trustworthy. I know they're really great functionally at their jobs. And when I was at Netflix, I would be like, we have this position open and they're like, mm, I don't want to work that hard at culture. I don't want to be judged if I'm not curious or something. And they were taking it to their own extremes, but they were like, I do want to come in and be great at my job and leave at the end of the day. They didn't lead people. They didn't have to have that extra element to it. Uh, but I have people like that now on my team and it's, I'm really pleased with having them there. <laughs> to your point, they're, they're doing their great job. Mm -hmm. Well, and that kind of goes back to our last question, right, about burnout. Like if they are happy at their jobs and doing things outside, they're gonna be probably more productive inside. Yeah. 
Octavius. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have to drink the Kool-Aid at all, but I, I, my experience with the five million people I've worked with over the last 23 years is that everyone wants to feel that, well, they've done something that matters. And so my suggestion, your lawyer may not want to feel part of the partner for the firm and work-life balance, but probably cares about their client, probably cares about doing a good professional job, probably cares about their code of ethics. So most of us, but pretty much everybody, cares about something. Mm. So the question is, how can you help people find the thing they care about come to life at work? And I think that's possible for all of us. And it's up to our leaders, our managers, us as HR professionals to ignite that passion that people have for something and bring it to the workplace. Mm. So this is our last question. We just have a few minutes and then we'll go down the line, starting with Matt. So um, we've talked a lot about individual and company purpose. I want to bring in kind of the community aspect here. How can a company's sense of purpose go beyond its business to encompass the larger community to the benefit of both the workers, the company, and the community? Matt, we'll start with you. G uh, small question to end with. Uh, <laughs> Only easy It's question. really a three-step plan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, it's just, my philosophy that if you're not, you live in a, an ecosystem, we all live in a community. If we muddy up the community, it may not get me tomorrow, but it's gonna get me eventually. And so companies are people, people live in the community. So you're already in the community. It's, you don't start off as separated from the community, you're in it. And then the question is, what are we gonna do as a member of this community? Are we gonna contribute to making it better? Which will in turn give me happier employees, better prospects for new employees, you know, our brand, and, and, and I will say the trend lines now with early career professionals and the young people coming in now, the data I've seen, both anecdotal and otherwise, shows they want to know that you're doing something good for the world. So it's very good for business to be investing in community these days. So if you don't do it for any other purpose, um, and now how do you do that? I mean, you need to figure out what your culture is and where, what that cultural translation to doing good mm -hmm. translates to. Mm -hmm. It could be days off to volunteer, or it could be if your company does a particular service, getting creative about where that could help. And I could see dedicating a certain percentage of time to, hey, let's take our innovation. How could we do, we could help an underserved community with this, mm -hmm. for example you're gonna win financially doing that anyway. So it's, it's a win-win, but there's so many things. It's just really being intentional about it and baking it into your culture. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you what we've done is that we, to, to, to Matt's point, we wanted to use our strength with a team of psychologists. And what we identified was that the single factor that most affects your life chances, other than where you're born and the environment, physical environment you're born in, is the quality and nature of the parenting that you have. Uh, and it determines things like your chance of having a secure relationship in life or ending up in jail or all sorts of things are, are predicted by the quality of parenting. And by and large, politicians don't want to touch parenting. I'm going to paraphrase terribly if I get in enormous trouble here. But basically, politicians of the right don't want to have a nanny state. And politicians of the left don't want to label poor parents as not good enough parents. So they tend to avoid this issue. So as a psychologist, we thought, this is brilliant. This is an opportunity for us to go in and make a real difference. So 15 years ago, we set up something called Parent Gym, where we run free parenting classes that are six courses, one a week, over a period of time, in areas of social deprivation. Uh, and we now have, I mean, we've run up to 1,000 classes at uh, school term now. Uh, and we've had it evaluated by four different universities. Uh, and one of them found the three different measures. Not only did it improve parenting self-efficacy and childhood outcomes, uh, but it also improved the mental well-being uh, and stress levels of the parents themselves. So their mental health improved as a result. So you can see how you can make a big difference. And we chose this because this is a basic a psychological problem. You think it's tough getting managers to do something differently and they get a bit stuck. Try telling parents that they're not good enough parents. And it's like, whoa, big explosion there. It doesn't work at all. So we use the psychology of persuasion. We do a parent gym for parents who care. Uh, and we had a wonderful team of volunteers who we trained and educated to do this. And some say it's a not-for-profit. I said, no, it's for loss, to Matt's point. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and when we had a tough time a number of years ago during the, the, the last recession, and someone said, do you, do you stop doing parent gym? And I said, well, the question is, is parent gym an item of clothing or is it a limb on your body? Because mm -hmm. if it's an item of clothing, you take it off and you stop it. But if it's a limb on your body, you don't cut off your arm. Uh, and so we kept it because it's part of who we are. So I feel very strongly that we absolutely need to give to community. We play to our strengths uh, and we make the best impact that way. Mm -hmm.
I would say at Activision, because of Call of Duty, we have the Call of Duty endowment, so it leans really heavy into supporting veterans uh, throughout the year, and they do a lot, a lot of work in that space. And internally, uh, we have a lot of support in that space as well for our employees who are veterans. Separate to that, between our employee resource groups and just teams that are passionate about different things, we really allow people the freedom to focus on the things that they're passionate about. Some people are really passionate about recycling and composting, and they want to make sure our office is as good as it can be. And so we're open to that, like make us better. You're the expert in it because you're studying it. Um, or if we go, my team did an offsite and we did like a beach cleanup because one person on my team was really passionate about uh, beach and pollution. And so that's opportunity that we took to just say like, oh, you're really passionate about it, teach us more. And then how to but leave the space for it. That's what we've been doing. Cool. I'll just add on that words matter. So you have to say the words and then follow the words with your actions. And so we were very specific when COVID hit in May of 2020, we actually drafted our company values and rolled them out in, in, uh, during COVID because the organization needed to know what we really cared about because it wasn't a lot of time to care about a whole lot of things. And so we started by talking about we're passionate about our brand, who we are, our reputation our food, our, our people, and the communities that we serve. And then we came behind that with actions. And obviously we were a central business, but then we empowered our people to say, you're essential, you're valuable to us. So we made a choice. Those values led us to a choice. We didn't shut down the office. They need to know when you're out there serving the community, millions of people, and at that point in time, we didn't know risking your life. You had to know if you called us, we were at our post at corporate to give you the support that you needed. So you have to start off with the words and then come behind it. I'll give you, when I come to these, I want a nugget to take back, so I'll make my attempt. <laughs> Go back and look at your values. If it sounds aspirational, it's not a value. Rewrite it. So your values are the minimum expectations that you will tolerate within your organization. You have to be very clear. So when you come to work with us, you can expect this. So I'm going to actively listen to understand, not just to respond. If you don't see me doing that, you need to call me out on that. It doesn't matter what level. If I'm looking at my phone during a conversation, that's disrespectful. That needs to be addressed. So managers, if you can't do that, then you won't be here. And when an organization and its people see leaders who don't want to lead get exited out, that empowers them and then they align with your purpose because they know you care enough about them to make the right decisions. So separate what's aspirational to what's your values, and that's your perspiration. That's where your work goes in, and that's gonna push your organization forward, and then invest in those communities and let your people see it. Good answer. Well, amen, and drop the mic. <laughs> I have to go after this. I was just gonna say E, all of the above, A, B, C, D, E, all of the above, but the, I'll, I'll say two things, what, and it's really, I'm piggybacking off of something that Amy said uh, that really stood out to me. So a couple of years ago, uh, during the craziness that we are still coming out of, uh, we did something where we asked employees, what are your passions? What do you like to do on the side? And then teach us, right? So set up, it was easy to set up a Zoom and have this person teach us how they cook this dish or teach us how they do that. And so it started me thinking about how do I bring my passion and purpose when the job isn't necessarily serving me? And that's part of the reason why I moved out of the practice of law and into working in human resources because it wasn't fulfilling me. And what is my passion? And my passion is really supporting and helping people and growing and developing people. And I couldn't really do that in my legal job, right? So I'm a coach on the outside. And a lot of what I do is spend my time fulfilling that purpose as I coach people. Now I get a chance to do it in the job too, but doing that as a coach outside. So what are your outside interests? I think to your point too, Matt, like what are your outside interests that help you fulfill that passion elsewhere that helps you also be at work to do the job, to get the paycheck, to be able to do the outside stuff. And then it's like, okay, it's all part of the purpose for me living my best life. So yeah, great. Well, thanks to all of our panelists for great answers. You can give them a round of applause.